This is Digital Marketing Fast Lane. This podcast will show you how to build, launch, grow, and scale a widely successful online business. Listen to real conversations with proven practical strategies and success stories. You're going to learn how to generate more traffic, more sales, more profit, and customer lifetime value for your online store. Coming to you from the online marketing experts at Boy Media. Here's your host, Kevin Urrutia. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's episode. And today we have Steve Watts of Slide Handboards. Hey, Steve, how are you today? Hey, how's it going, Kevin? How are you doing? Good. I'm doing great. I'm so excited to have you here on board and great to talk about your story and sort of, you know, the brands that you have built. Um, so, Steve, can you tell us a little bit about your background and you know, maybe where you grew up? Sure. Um, well, I was uh, go right to the beginning. I was... Um, I was born in uh, in Cape Town in a small um, little town just outside of the city called Hape, um, and uh, kind of just grew up on the beach down there. You know, it's where my my mom would take us, me and my brother, to get out of the house, and um, that was you know the kind of um, pretty pretty cool lifestyle. And then we moved up the uh, the coast when I was about eight or nine, and you know, loved growing up there, loved, um, still love it, obviously. Uh, it's, you know, my home country and, um, you know, always got an affinity towards it. Uh, but I was a traveler and I um, sort of, when I was about 18 or 19, I, you know, packed my bags and uh, headed to London. And uh, from there was a great, London's a great place to um, sort of see the world from because it's got such a strong currency and you you don't have to work that long to earn enough money to go and really have a good time in other places and uh, I, so I spent most of my 20s doing that it wasn't until I was about 27 I decided to get my degree in product design um, at a university in London um, called Central St. Martin's had a fantastic time doing that really loved it and uh, kind of that's where it started me off on the uh, the entrepreneurial uh, path, which I'd always wanted to go on. I actually remember when I was 15 or 16 telling my mom, I'm going to be a multimillionaire by the time I'm 30. <laughs> well, you know, when you're 16, 30 seems a long time, like a long way away. But nonetheless, you know, that was, that was kind of where that started. So. And then sort of how did, your, how did your family end up in South Africa? You know, did you kind of know what that background or history is there? Yeah. Um, actually, I'm third generation African. So um, my grandmother and mother were born uh, in Zambia. My dad is actually English. So he came from London when he was about 19 as well. And uh, he went, I, I believe they met in uh, Zimbabwe. Well, now Zimbabwe at the time, it was called Rhodesia. And then they moved down to South Africa. I think uh, it was my mom was pretty strong world mm-hmm. at the time and was like, well, if you're going to come, you're going to come, right? <laughs> so uh, my dad followed, followed her down there. And uh, yeah, I, I believe um, my grandparents on my mother's side mm-hmm. had moved down to work in the copper mines in Rhodesia. It was a mm-hmm. kind of... I, I want to say it was the thing to do back, you know, there was a lot of money to be made in the copper mines. I don't believe they made too much of it, or at least I didn't see any of it, but (laughs) Uh, nonetheless, they, yeah, they work. They, um, that's where that's, that's in a nutshell, I believe like how it all started. Okay. And then sort of when you went to London, was that sort of, you trying to go see where your, you know, your father grew up, you know, since that's where, okay. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, not at all. Um, it was because I have a British passport by by birthright because mm-hmm. my dad was born there. Um, it was it was really like I'm 100% like African <laughs> yeah. in, in heart, so I don't I don't really hold any affinity to maybe Scotland a little bit, mm-hmm. but not really. So yeah, it wasn't about that. It was it was literally just about going uh, exploring. And, yeah, exploring. Boring. Okay, perfect. You said that you went to your school at 27 for your product design. Mm-hmm. What made you decide that like, you know, at 27, you know, most people would be like, I don't want to go to school or I don't, I don't think I need this. What made you decide to go do that after so many years of, you know, not essentially? Uh, well, you know, I had, um, I kind of missed out. I, I had gone to school when I was 18 um, for a brief moment, but you know, the, the, 
the university was right on the beach in, in Durban in South Africa where I live. So um, surfing was a huge part of my life, which is something I didn't mention before, but um, I'd been surfing since I was 11 or 12. And, mm -hmm. and um, so we would kind of make a beeline for the, you know, go down to university for, for, for classes and we would be like, the beach seems like a much better idea. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't ready to study at that point mm -hmm. or to learn. Well, no, that's wrong. I, I was ready to learn, just not not sitting in a in, in a class. Mm -hmm. To me, uh, when I was going to that university, I felt like I was just in high school, like sitting, listening, yeah. and, and it just, it, like there was nothing that, I, I'm not the kind of person that can do something just for the sake of doing it. I have to really love it, mm -hmm. um, which is a good thing and a bad thing. So I really appreciate people who can, who can actually um, really put their heart and mind and soul into something that they really don't enjoy. But yep. for me, I, I can't do that. Like I just, I, it's not, yeah. not that I even can't, it's just, I, it ends up being a complete mess. Yeah. I, I don't put any effort in whatsoever because I don't want to do it. Um, I, yeah. I, exactly. I tell people like, I think I know exactly what you're feeling. I always tell people like I'm unemployable just because yeah. I only want to do what I want to do. <laughs> oh, I'm comp like, <laughs> I'm completely unemployable. Yeah, I really am, and I know that for a fact. I mean, it's uh, yeah, it's not, it's not it's, something I'm, I'm capable of doing. Yeah, same. Like, yeah, like I have employees too, and I'm just like, I so crazy that you would do something like this, even though you might not like it, and it's yeah. just because yeah it's yeah. my idea and I would not be able to do that for somebody else. No, I I I couldn't. Um, I can't take. Um, I can't take people telling me what to do. And I think I went to boarding school yeah. um, when I was 13 um, till I was about into high school. And um, I think I've gotten, I, it might've been from that. I had thoroughly enjoyed going to boarding school. Yeah. Really enjoyed it. I got my best friends from there, but like you get told what to do every moment of the day. And it's like, you have to do this. It's all rules, rules, rules. And so I don't know, maybe it has something to do with that, like kind of revolting against having to, uh, having to deal with that or, you know, for five years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I know exactly what you're feeling. So once you went to school, I guess at 27, you know, how long were you there for? Was it like a four-year program, a two-year program? Yeah, it's, um, so the, the school, I actually, I was in Vietnam, mm. funny enough. I was just discussing this with somebody else. I was in Vietnam at the time, um, traveling. Uh, Hanoi and I was like I think it's time I went and did something that I, I wanted I want to be good at something I mm -hmm. think was exactly the reason that I wanted to start so I you know I just kind of went through it was it was a process of finding what I wanted to do because obviously at the age of 27 you know when you're 18 people kind of almost decide for you and and mm -hmm. you're like oh yeah you know you just go and choose any degree for me that wasn't a choice like I knew I was going to be paying for this mm -hmm. and so the choice needed to be something that I was going to do for the rest of my life regardless of what that was it needed to be something that I enjoyed mm -hmm. and and um you know I'd I'd always been good at art and and that kind of stuff so that kind of gravitated towards mm -hmm. something that I could do in that realm that I could make money from and and product design kind of really stuck out to me mm -hmm. um, through the research that I did. And I didn't even realize there was actually, a, you could actually do that as a, as a degree, you know, mm -hmm. be an industrial designer or product designer. Um, and so I did a bunch of research. I ended up finding a, a school in the United States in, in, um, uh, in San Francisco mm -hmm. that I went to. I ended up going there for two years and then I, I uh, relocated back to London to uh, I always say Lon I finished I finished in London so that was where yeah. I got my degree from um, so I ended up doing another two and a half years there so it was like it was a four year degree okay perfect um, and then and then, and then to you like product design what does that mean to sort of to you when you were researching it obviously now it's it means so many things like kind of what you said industrial design product design there's product designers for like websites there's yeah. product designers for but what does it what does that mean to you when you were first researching it. Well, I did that was 10 years ago. So yeah. product design, you know, it was funny because I actually, I had, I was very unique in that I had, well, I was very, um, uh, I wouldn't say I was new, unique, but my situation was unique in that I, I got to learn two very different styles of product design, which was one in the United States and one, one in, in the UK. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, in the UK, it's, it's far more, um, 
cerebral. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, you know, for our, for, for, you know, we would have to do what they call a context and rationale. Um, and we would have to read, I just read so many books, Freud, um, all sorts of different books, psychology books. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, in, in the, in the school here, uh, in San Francisco was way more, um, hands-on. In other words, you were building stuff, um, which, you know, both sides you need, you need to be able to use your mind and, mm -hmm. and kind of, um, uh, like just see the way people interact with, with products and be able to, to find a solution to, you know, you look beyond what people are actually just playing with an item. You actually see the problems that are arising when they're using that. Mm -hmm. And then you've also got to have the ability to be able to sketch that out or, or do, um, a more, you know, do a, um, a quick prototype. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was what I, the prototyping and the sketching, I was streaks ahead of everybody else when I got to the UK but my sort of design thinking was I, I wouldn't say far behind but definitely not where it needed to be so that's what I focused on when I was in the UK okay so that's interesting so basically you got best of both worlds where yeah I did and, and to answer your question what it means to me is I I, be, I truly believe everybody is a designer. Mm -hmm. um, I try to tell my my wife, she's like, oh, I can't design stuff. And I'm like, everybody's designing it. Mm -hmm. Like at every point, you know, you design everything around you yep. to fit into your life. I mean, that's design, right? Yeah. Like to me, design is about creating a world that like you want to live in. Um, I mean, it could be making stuff pretty or it could be making stuff you know, more yeah. usable. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's all various different ways of looking at it. I just, um, I, I truly think design is, we can design us. So there's a great book um, designing ourselves out of, you know, the, the problems the world faces at the moment. There's, uh, there's all sorts of different forms of design, but me, I particularly, I love, uh, like, I love objects. So, yeah. you know, that was, um, the, yeah, the pure uh, product design, but yeah, yeah like, exactly. As opposed to kind of all the, the other offshoots that have mm -hmm. come, that, you know, somebody sitting around thinking about different things to. Yeah. Yeah. No, but exactly what you said, like everything around you is designed by someone just like you that thought about it. And, yeah. Yeah. And that's not, they're not that. I always tell people like you can design anything you want. It's sort of, you know, the person designing it doesn't mean they're smarter than you. They just thought about it and wanted to execute on it. Yeah, no, it's, it's, you know, they just have a different way of looking at it. I have a very interesting story, actually. Um, uh, Jonathan Ives, who was the, um, he's the head designer for, um, for Apple. Uh, he did a talk at our school because he was getting an honorary degree from there. Okay. And it's a, it's a really, uh, you know, the school I went to, um, Paul McCartney's daughter went there, you know, so it's a, it's a, it's a really, you know, well-established school. It's been around for, you know, uh, and a long time. So, you know, it was, we had a lot of really great people coming and talking. He was one of them. And um, he was saying that, you know, when, when they designed the iPod and they, what he did was he took his, he took a team of people and they sat outside a, a London underground and they watched people going in, in and out on their, on their commute. And I don't know if you remember at the time, but we had mini disc players yep. and, and CD players and Walkmans and, yep. Walkmans and all sorts of stuff, right? So they noticed that these people going in and out, he was like, what, what don't they have? And, you know, nobody could answer the question. And like, they don't have two hands to be able to use because one's got paper, you're carrying a briefcase, you've got, you only have one hand to be able to operate a, a product. Mm -hmm. And he's like, that's where the first little like ideation mm -hmm. for the iPod, nobody could, nobody could figure out why it became so mm -hmm. like incredible is because they had, they had an, uh, they, they created, created this, this device that you could operate with one hand. Yep. And that's what set it apart from absolutely everything else. I mean, apart from all the cool design and yeah. all that kind of stuff. But the fact that like they had answered a, a question that people were repeatedly asking themselves is like, oh my God, I'm dropping my, my yeah. iPod on the floor for the 50th time, my, my papers all over. They noticed that that was what was happening. People have a tendency to just blame themselves for the products around them. Mm -hmm. 
And I actually, um, ever since, you know, becoming a product designer, I no longer do that. I blame the product yep. because it hasn't been designed properly. Yep. So, you know, that's, if something's going wrong, it's almost 100% of the time, it's the product's fault, not yours, because yep. it should be designed around the humans that are using it. Unless yeah. you're obviously not using something that should be used for a human or it's been designed to not be able to be used, which is, you know, that's, the whole <laughs> that's another type of design. Yeah, no, yeah. But that, 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 that makes sense because yeah, I mean, with iPhones and iPods, it's one hand use. And it reminds me of a story that I heard for, you know, video game designers. So we live here in the city, probably London also has the underground, but the most successful games here are those games that you can play with one hand because most of the time the subway, the other hand is attached to the handrail. Yeah, exactly. So you're holding on. Yeah. yeah. So you can use and two games, uh, two hands, essentially. Yeah. It yeah. totally makes sense. Yeah, it's I an think... observation that like they made um, and because they were, they were product designers, mm -hmm. they, they knew that that was a solution. Like there was, you know, a lot of people, if you, if you're not in that headspace, yeah. Um, but if you honestly, just, if you walk around, and you see the way people use stuff around them. Mm -hmm. It's really easy to come up with solutions yeah. to the problem because you're like, if that's why, like, you you see somebody bending over to, that's why you know, like, women um, with or or anybody using a, a push cart for for a for a child, like, there's so much design that goes into that because yeah. of you know, like being able to, to, to sort of open it with one hand or, and they, I don't think they've got it right. We, we have a two year old and, yeah, and it's, you know, the, the push cards we've used are like terrible. I think, I think everything, everything needs to be designed by Johnny Ive and he yeah, just, needs to yeah. look, look what this is, this is interesting because I want to know what are your thoughts on like the AirPods, you know, that is essentially a product design. That's, I, I think when it first came out, everybody was like, this is so ugly. This is so weird. And then, I have them now and I cannot live without them just because they're just so useful. And like, I don't know. I love mine. The AirPods are the, I'm not an Apple guy. So oh, God, you need to get uh, them. Steve. Like, the uh, the, yeah. the ones that like the, um, the Wi-Fi connected yeah, with the Bluetooth? Bluetooth ones. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have Bluetooth earbuds, mm -hmm. I uh, Bluetooth um, headphones and I, I mean, I can't live without them. Yeah. I use them all the time. I walk around with them. They're the ones that go around my neck. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. But, um, yeah, well, think, you know, they, they're, they're the full head ones. The full ones. Um, yeah. But, but yeah. Yeah. Even then I think that's sort of like another interesting observation too, where, you know, at least for me when I'm running, I don't want to have the wires dangling or that, big issue was happening before was you would stuff the cord in your pocket and then it would be like a little maze trying to untangle them every single time. It's, it's yeah. that. Um, and, and you know, when I'm running on a, cause I, I like to do treadmill. It's not as hard on my knees. Mm -hmm. Um, then, you know, like the, 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 uh, you know, running on the, the, uh, the tarmac or the, the asphalt. Mm -hmm. And, um, anyway, the, uh, the amount of times that I've hooked my thumb <clears throat> as I'm running, you know, yeah. I'm running like that and, and the cord catches yeah. and the iPod flies across the room or hits the thing and bounces yeah. back and hits the, you know, or not yeah. the, your phone or whatever you're. So yeah, I Wi-Fi. I can't wait until there are no cords left on the earth. Oh yeah. Uh, like I was just thinking about the other day. I wish because I'm outside, all our electric lines are running around and yeah. it, you're like, we've got a beautiful view of the ocean but there's a massive electric, like massive electric lines in the way. And I'm yep. like, when, when's that going to go? Yeah. I, I can't stand it. So yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I mean this whole, the whole earth is covered by just power lines, electric lines. Yeah. And it, that also reminds me of the product design of this is for taking this conversation. So we're random, but it reminds, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it reminds you of like design of cities, like parking lots is a big space where I don't think they should be there. It should be somewhere hidden naturally underground there's so much space like even mall parking lot just massive amounts of space that could be something else and how do you design around uh something like that and i don't know i, I product design and thinking about that i, I really i'm into that as well <laughs> there's a great book called um designing in i know the the author is john Fakara, um and designing in the bubble I believe, and you could, you could look it up. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
yeah, he he talks not 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 necessarily about the the parking lot thing, but just how we can design our way out of the the situations that we got ourselves into. Mm-hmm. It's a really interesting design centered book mm-hmm. um, that was actually required reading for us. Um, and he, like he, I'm sure he's brought out others since there because yeah. just his observations are just incredible. Um, and and you know, I I I think that the parking lot thing. That's, you know, you, you start with the problem, which is, you know, they're ugly, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, there's even a song about, park, <laughs> you know, uh, pick up a parking lot or whatever it's, um, and, and, you know, you start with that, that issue and they are, they're ugly. Yeah. And, um, you know, cars are actually beautiful, almost, uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, most of them are gorgeous. Yep. Um, you know, they're design like marvels. I mean, if you really think about it. Yeah. And so, you know, it's it's like how can you like maybe don't you know, make them disappear, but just how do you beautify them in a way that that is, you know, and it's the same with buildings. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you look at some buildings where it's just a cement block, and then yeah. other buildings where, you know, it's a Frank Lloyd Wright building where it's just absolutely gorgeous and he's designed it. You know, it's everything just has a purpose, and and then you got somebody else who designed something and just be like, this is going to be an office building. Yeah. So yeah, I I just think a little bit of thought that goes into, um, uh, I believe it's got a lot to do with just being present and mm-hmm. and uh, you know the the idea that like you know um, people think mm-hmm. about the stuff that they put in places. Um, instead of just and you know just putting a utilitarian like building somewhere that serves a purpose, they should actually you know build it with some thought behind it. Yeah, it's about like you know designing something that's delightful, especially if it's something that's going to be seen every day, and you know you could potentially bring joy to someone's day. It's like oh, yeah. it's a nice building, and versus oh, there's that building. <laughs> yeah, there's um. Uh, set of design books I, I can't remember what they're what they're called I'd, I'd have to look it up and you can put it in the show notes but um he talks about um design should be user-friendly blah 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 you know and he, he like his first book is just very much about like the technique of designing something that works which is you know and then in his his and he was vehemently against you know, just stuff that didn't have any use. And then um, he actually changed his mind off of one, one particular interaction that a friend had with a, um, with a product that was a a little tea strainer that was a monkey that held onto the side of the, uh, of the, the, the mug. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you put your tea in there and it strains it. And he was saying like, you know, normally I'd be vehemently against it because it's almost like pointless design. Like yep. it's, it doesn't, doesn't serve a purpose. I mean, you could do it some other way than having a monkey do it, you know, but he was saying that he, know, he watched how his friend interacted with this monkey. And for that moment that he interacted with the monkey, it brought him joy, it brought him like, mm-hmm. you know, he smiled, he had, you know, and he's like, it completely changed my outlook on the way that I, I, I believe design should be, um, is that, you know, everything, even the, the if, even if it creates a minute reaction or a mm-hmm. minute sort of interaction with somebody, it served its purpose. Yep. And so, you know, like, so long as it's it's doing what, well, not necessarily, even if it's not doing what you want it to do, but it's creating a reaction. Um, but if it's definitely, if, you know, you create something to make somebody smile or, or laugh or, or maybe even make them sad, I don't know, it depends on what, I mean, yeah. if you're, you know, depends on what you're, what, what you're doing, but um, he was, yeah, it, it basically changed his entire sort of thesis on, on, on design. how he looked at design, yeah. Perfect. And Which I follow. I follow exactly. Like I think. Yeah. I think something. If something can can make somebody happy, even for you know ten minutes in a day, I think you've done your job. And then sort of, I guess going back to sort of like, um, how have you sort of incorporated these sort of details into, I guess, your first company, Slide Handboard? You know, with the design, the details. What are those moments of joy that you found when building your product? Well, it takes, uh, you know, yeah. you know, the handboards are 
a labor of love. Um, you know, we, uh, it took me a long time to sort of come to the right, the little curves and the, and the details that go into the, into each board. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's got a lot to do with the materials you mm-hmm. use and, 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 uh, cause every product it's course the semiotics, um, is basically every product that you look at, Mm-hmm. Um, speaks to you it actually has a language it's, it's semiotics of the language of, of products and and mm-hmm. if you can imagine a salt shaker you know how to use a salt shaker because it it, it tells you how to use it you know mm-hmm. it's it's maybe it's angled up like that and there's you know there's something inside it's see-through and you can see the holes in the top and you know how to use it and so it was really important to me to be able to to use um those semiotics or that language Mm -hmm. to to convey fun to convey bright happy happiness and you know and 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 also it varies from you know we have a a lower end or not lower end but a sort of beginner Mm -hmm. board all the way up to a pro level and um each of those boards uh we have four of them have to convey a certain use for the particular person that I had in mind when I was designing it for. Anybody can use them, but it's specifically designed for a certain person um, Mm. that, you know, obviously our foam, our our beginner board is foam. It's soft. Mm. It's nice. It's, it's welcoming. It's got round corners. It's not sharp. Um, You know, so, you know, the, the, like the materials we use are nice and spongy. So it's, it, it doesn't, it's not, um, Whereas it, it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't look like it's difficult to use. Mm-hmm. It looks like you could just pick it up and use it. Whereas a smaller one is, uh, which is the pro level one, you know, it's got sharp corners. It's got real deep concave that if you didn't know what, you know, how to ride a surfboard or you didn't understand hydrodynamics, you would be like, why is it like that? <laughs> but if you do, you understand exactly what that's for. You know, it's basically a suction on the side of the face of the wave. And so, um, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of thought that went into um, thought and process that that goes um, almost naturally. Like once you've you've been doing design for a long time, it just it's something that just you, you just do. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, still, you still have to think about it. Yeah, because I think what you're saying is, you know, you have to be able to design for your audience and sort of what they're used to and sort of you know, make your products essentially, you know, keep leveling them up because through your product, through the beginner, you're sort of teaching them maybe something about aerodynamics, dynamics, yeah. that way. So the next one, they get it. And it's not just about them buying a product, it's about them sort of experiencing and saying, and then challenging themselves too, because then yeah. you make them better. And then- Yeah, exactly. And, and, and your product, especially a you know, high-end product mm-hmm. needs to convey that. Um, you know, we use carbon fiber, Mm-hmm. and uh you know we, we it's basically saying step up yep uh, step up and like try use me let's see if you've got the you know you got the guts to like drop in on a you know, on a 15 foot <laughs> face away for this like because that's what it's used for and it should say that it shouldn't be it shouldn't be the opposite of like i'm not going to be able to handle the job that mm-hmm. you are you know set out to do and so um I mean, yeah. it's, it's why things that are industrial, de- industrially designed, in other words, um, for industry and stuff, you know, you don't see, a, you know, a big um, tanker ship with, you know, flowers and whatnot. Mm-hmm. It's like they're big bolts and yeah. like everything is conveying that they're tough and they yep. can withstand big seas and stuff like that. But a speedboat, you know, yeah. that's all to be, you know, you, it's, it, once you start to understand like how things are actually designed specifically for their use and for a sp- certain person, you can start to see like the semiotics of what, what the, you know, it's sleek, it's, it's beautiful. It's, you know, the curves and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Whereas the tanker ship is just, it's, it's utilitarian. Like it's just there to be tough. Yeah. And do you think Steve, that people now are paying more attention to product design than before? What are your thoughts on that? You know, do you think design is something that people care about or, you know, I think, I think people have always cared about it. They just didn't have a, have a word for it. You know, Mm -hmm. like, I don't think, I think, I think Apple was, a was, I mean, that was their, 
uh, democratization of design was it was you know that's what they they set out to do and they did it very well um, and they made people aware that they wanted beautiful products mm-hmm. um, so I think people have been made aware I don't think I think it would be if you didn't have companies like um, you know Asus and, and and Apple and Nike and and whatnot coming out with these you know, beautiful, beautifully designed packaging and, and products. And Mm -hmm. I don't think many people would, you know, they would just take the status quo, but because, you know, because they've been immersed in it now for, for a long time, I think people are, you know, if if you don't see that in another product, Mm -hmm. you, you've, they've set the high, the, the bar really high. And so now people know what to look for. So yeah, I think in that yeah, people are definitely taking more note of design. But I think people are, um, you know, design is it's kind of like a a word people just use, mm-hmm. and um, you know they're like, oh, that's design, designed as in it's you know you put some like pretty flowers on it or mm-hmm. something. Um, whereas you know design is a lot deeper than that. I, yeah. I, I you know like I was saying, it, it goes into like how somebody uses it in, in the semiotics of, the, you know, the curves and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. It's like design is the, you know, design of it looks nice, but then it's also like your design, which is the, the, the deeper meaning of it and sort of, yeah. and I think a good way to, for people to just, maybe people can relate to this is if you think about, I'm not sure if you watch like Chef's Table on Netflix, yeah. there's obviously yeah. like, there's some cooks, anybody can cook. But then there's cooks that design food, the oh, yeah, the smell. Yeah, the whole experience. And, and that's a big thing now, too, is design experience, obviously. Designing mm. and experience. And yeah. something I was really interested, um, you know, just after I left school was, like, the experience that, you know, like, design is not just, like, the product. Mm-hmm. It's everything that comes in, that whole experience that you have. And it's something that... You know, with our new company, um, Feldscum, which we're, you know, we're, we've just started, you know, we're going through that process at the moment, which is designing from every touch point in like how we want that product to, what we want that product to say to that person. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they're utilitarian shoes and they're beautiful and they're like crafted by, you know, South Africans and, and you know, everything that that shoe is has and it's you know it's a four three four hundred year old shoe mm-hmm. design um that's been copied a thousand times but it's like the original and so we need to like get that across and how do we get that across and it's a really interesting almost you have to go when you when when i'm doing it i i kind of almost go into this black hole mm-hmm. it's 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 fun and it's scary and it's kind of weird because you know you kind of you you just go into this the zone where all you see and feel and everything around you is is how can i how can i like you know you just start to notice things all over the place and it's um it's kind of like i said it's fun yep. but it, you know the wife doesn't like it much because it's going to disappear for a while <laughs> yeah it's it's with anybody with any sort of hobby or passion it's you can yeah easily just disappear in it. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. And then, yeah, Steve, so I want to talk about, you know, talk about your brand new company, you know, sort of, you know, how did that start? You know, where was your mindset of this thing I want to take on that's new for you? You know, kind of how did, maybe how did the company come into your radar? Yeah. So, um, I'm trying to s- think I could tell the story the best way, but, um, you know, I mean, it goes right back to my, my childhood. So anyway, the, the, you know, the new company, you know, we've, we've had slide for nearly 10 years started in, I started it when I was actually 16. I knew that's what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I knew that I was having fun on these products and, 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 handboarding and body surfing was just so much fun. Uh, I surfed, I do everything in the ocean. I love it. And, um, you know, we, uh, me and my wife, I, I started and she came in about two years after that. And we, this was in 2010 when we were officially launched then mm-hmm. I'd been working on it way before then. And, and we've built it to something that's amazing. It's incredible. 
And uh, just last year, we were both like, we would like to like have something, you know, we want to take the, the, the connections because we were on Shark Tank with Slide and we have a wonderful partners in, in Ashton Kutcher and, and Mark Cuban. And they were, inc- they've been incredible for us. And um, the connections that they have, you know, helped us grow has just been incredible. So, you know, we, we have such an opportunity to like, to create more stuff. And um, so, you know, it had been, it was last year, uh, winter last year, because slide is really slow during the, during the winter. And then during the summer, it just explodes. So it was during the winter, I was like, you know, it'd be nice just to have something that like we could, we could use, you know, we could, start and would work through winter too so we had something to work on in winter so we could like kind of rotate and um like i said we had you know we have all the knowledge and like tried every single app ever made on shopify and i have all this knowledge and and i felt it was going to waste on just one one and and i'm also um i'm i'm kind of add so i i was as you probably hear i'm like you know i've got the right brain i believe i don't know i've got the design side brain so it's all over the place and I was like I gotta do I've got to find something else and and um you know my um I ended up going my mom got very sick and I ended up going to South Africa which hadn't been on the on the on the radar to go but you know because she was sick I you know I had to go Mm -hmm. over and um my uh my wife Ange and my daughter um Venice um they visited their their grandmother and her mother in um in in Rhode Island and I went to South Africa and and I was like you know it's it's my birthplace and I I I want to it's such an amazing culture an amazing place and I want to bring something over from South Africa so anyway my cousins my cousins happened to be there at the same time I was there and uh, we were at a at a restaurant and I see this girl walk past me wearing a pair of shoes that are from my childhood and I went to school like I said at a boarding school and the boarding school was actually a farm school too as well so we used to wear these shoes called feldskin and they were a leather shoe that had been around for centuries like I mean everybody just knows what feldskin are in South South Africa we call them fellies so I'll I'll continue (laughs) calling them fellies because nobody can say feldskin so everybody like knew what fellies are in South Africa they're like a traditional shoe they're iconic um, super hard wearing. Um, you can you can wear them in the the, the the heat, and a lot of the farmers wear them because they're super durable. And I saw them, and it was kind of like a little like fashion statement almost. And I'm like, boom! I'm gonna bring them to to America. So I looked them up, and I I see um, there was a, actually a company there that um, online that was already doing what I I immediately was like, they'd be cool with colors. Like I don't know, like that'd be awesome. And, um, you know, without, and then I started looking and I found the company doing exactly what I want to do was, was color soles and color laces. And I was like, I like, that's a bummer. They're already, you know, they already got it. So I'm like, I let, I let it, you know, I was, I was just on my phone. Um, and then, uh, we went to a mall and I was like, I was kind of walking around. I couldn't get it out of my head. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm like, let me just email these guys and yep. see, you know what their deal is so i said are you guys in america and they said like yeah we're go- we're going to be but we're you know we really want to be but we're not yeah so i'm like oh, okay cool and i let it sit for about 2 days and then i emailed them back and i said look here's the deal this is what we have this is what we built over there we have a lot of very good connections for exactly what you guys are looking for you know we can build your company and they like literally like before i'd even sent it i think they were like they were calling me back (laughs) yeah and um this was september of last year and as of two weeks ago we just signed the deal to Mm -hmm. to have um 50 percent of the 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 distribution well we own the united states Mm -hmm. so we we're basically the owners of feldskin here in the united states with a 50 50 with them in 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 south africa and so we're bringing this iconic Mm -hmm. amazing shoe to um to the united states and it um you know was it's, you know, it's nerve wracking starting. We actually start, you know, we, before we had signed, we'd already like built the website and we were doing testing and stuff because we knew we all wanted to work together. It was just a, you know, the legal stuff, um, which came in, which, yep. 
um, you know, I, I can go into if you want to, but it's a, it, like, it's so much work, the le- just the legal stuff. And I, I, and I advise anybody doing any kind of agreement, always have an agreement. I was discussing this with our lawyer yesterday and she was just like, it's, it's the most important thing. Like it's so important. Yep. Um, but nonetheless, we, um, we signed the, we signed the deal, but we'd been doing like all this testing and we, we it's just, I, I mean, I put some ads up on, on Facebook, um, because obviously, you know, starting from scratch, you don't, you know, you, it's shoe. I mean like Nike and, and, you know, yeah. Zappos and stuff. So we were like, the only way we're going to do is just, um, going to do well with this is if we do some ads on, on Facebook and it just blew up. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, we were like, wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had to dial down the, um, down the ads and, and, um, you know, cause we didn't have enough um, stuff and it was just a- enough, um, uh, stock. And we, uh, we were just like, okay, we know it's going to fire. And, and so we, we signed the deal and, um, uh, you know, we got my friend who's in a media agency, mm-hmm. um, up in Los Angeles, um, you know, and again, another one of the connections, although I've, I've known him for ages, um, that they were like, this is the most incredible story about this shoe and we want to be involved in it. And we'll like, so they're doing all the marketing, you know, the actual Facebook stuff and, and, um, yeah, it's been, it's been great so far. So, you know, fingers crossed. And then, yeah, I would say for like the, like, how does it feel for you to like, I guess, be able to work on something new after so long of, you know, obviously working on your passion, but this is like a new found passion. And, you know, how does it feel yeah. like, does it reinvigorate you essentially? Yeah. I'm a big believer in, uh, yeah, it absolutely invigorates. Like, you know, um, you know, slide is always me is always going to be my baby. I, I love working on it. I love the, I love our community. It's so engaged. Um, and, and they're just awesome. I mean, we're, you know, we're, you know, we, uh, our family friends with a lot of our riders parents and you know it's just incredible um but yeah you know this is it's for me and i like i don't know if you listen to simon sinek at all but finding your why um and i i think any every entrepreneur should at least listen to that and i I, you know take everything with a grain of salt but um i really believe in in finding your why and and being authentic about who you are and what you I mean for me personally I like I said I cannot do something if I don't believe in it yep. and for me like Feldskun is I I almost get like emotional talking about it because it, it comes I mean you know like um, Prince Harry wears them wow. um, you know Nelson Mandela wore them like they're they're part of our heritage I, I don't even see myself as we're we're just, um, we're the, uh, I, I don't know what the real word is, but we're the, um, the kind of gatekeepers to it. Mm. We don't own it. Uh, we don't own Feldskern. It, it has a, a life of its own. Like yeah. they are, um, you know, that's how deep the brand goes. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so we're, we're stewards to it and, and we're just, we're just, we, ha- every day I have to do, I have to get up. Mm-hmm. and be the best that I can be for everybody that's come before that and everybody like, you know, my entire heritage. Yep. So that's, it's super important to me to just make this the very best that it can be. Yeah. Cause um, with, with, yeah. Cause with felt schoons, you're, you're not just selling a product, you're selling the history, your country, what people are yeah. for, have worn for, for a long time. And it feels yeah. good to be able to show it to the world and, you know, promote it and, and, and use all that sort of, a credibility connections that you've had to, you know, show it to the world because that's sort of what we're made to do, I guess. Like, you know, yeah. like sometimes yeah, it's exactly what you just said is yeah. exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Perfect. You know, how has, I guess, working with this team in South Africa been, you know, like do you guys have weekly sort of like a more of a just team communication? How has that oh, been? Oh yeah. Yeah. As far as that, Oh, I, you know, it, it, it is, um, we're doing really well and we all get on mm-hmm. the, I mean, there are, Honestly, like, I hope they listen to this. They're like fantastic people. Yeah. Like just you know, like the, the people themselves. And, and, and something I, I learned a long time ago is I just being in business, you know, like everybody's had that dick boss, mm-hmm. you know, that boss that is just like every, 
at, at some point if you haven't you're very lucky and so I, I learned a long time ago I did not want to do business if I'm going into business I'd rather just be broke than mm -hmm. than have to deal with people that I don't enjoy and yep. so these guys are just genuinely nice people mm -hmm. and great business people to be involved and yeah it has its it has its um it's difficulties with being so far away, but that's the only, that's the only thing, but we have like a weekly meetup, um, on zoom, which is yep. awesome. I love zoom. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, we all get on and we all discuss stuff and, um, we all get stoked and get fired up and then, you know, spend another week and come back and do it all over again. And, you know, they've given us complete, um, autonomy, I yep. believe is the word to, yeah. um, to really just, take the United States to the next level and, and they completely trust in what we're doing. And, um, so yeah, it's, it, it is again, like you, you have to have the communication. Like we use yeah. Slack, which worked. Yeah. Then we use what, like now we like, we, we have like a WhatsApp group okay. which seems yep. to be working, but, um, you know, so I th it's funny, you go through these like, um, like phases of like, everybody wants to be on Slack yeah. and then everybody wants to be like, everybody's listening on, 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 you know, and it's funny, you listen to these companies tell you how good their software works. And it's, it's funny, like the actual reality of how stuff oh. really does work. Yeah. Yeah. Like Slack is like, I love Slack. We use Slack here, but it's like, yeah. Mm. always you're always on with slack it's like less email it's like no actually like i think i get more messages in slack now and yeah. it's more of like i need to check it right now or else like i'm freaking out yeah yeah, yeah. And, and and so we we try to we try to keep it up and uh but really i mean you know we're we're building here and um and you know the cool thing about like what they're doing over there is it's not just feldskin they've got other products that they're continually like, they're kind of like a think tank almost. okay over there and um you know in south africa it's very i mean it's it's archaic as far as the internet is concerned yeah. it's like people don't get it there's a lot of very clever people but as far as the e-commerce side of things is concerned it's it's i noticed it when i was over there it's like wow mm -hmm. people are still talking about wow you bought something online oh my god oh like, <laughs> uh, yeah you know, so I, you know, that's something I did notice over there and people that have a um, kind of mistrust for it, you know, mm -hmm. they're like, Oh, this is a scam immediately. Mm -hmm. Like, no, your product is on the way, dude. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, you know, it's, um, there's anyway, still, but, yeah. I mean, and that's something interesting to talk about too, because there's such a huge <laughs> opportunity for entrepreneurs to go there and see what advantages they can do and sort of help out because, you know, America has an advantage, which is people are used to this online thing. Yeah. And it yeah. did take a while for people to get used to it. But now with like, I mean, you probably know, Amazon just pretty much made it so that everybody believes this online thing. <clears throat> yeah. I, I think know. they were, they were, they were probably top. I mean, what, like how long have they been around? I mean, uh, Amazon been years around. now. I think for, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, I think for consumers, it's great. But as for small business owners, Amazon is deadly because they, I don't know, I just, they just take over everything. Well, I actually, I'm not going to disagree. I agree with you to a certain extent, mm -hmm. but I think something that Amazon, and we work with Amazon a lot, and, and they've been great for our business as far as, you know, especially Slide, we haven't, we don't do Feltzgun on there um, because it's new. Um, and I don't know if we will, mm -hmm. but you know, I was actually at a, at a, at a talk yesterday about, um, about this very subject. And I, I think, you know, one of the things that I, I truly believe with, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't fear Amazon at all. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I should, I don't know, but what I, I, there's something, they're so big, they can never deliver what a small company can mm -hmm. deliver. And I'm talking service, the whole thing, yeah. you know, I mean, at Amazon, it's just, you get a product. It's for people who want, you know, it's the Walmart, it's the online Walmart shopper, basically. Like you want something and I like, don't get me wrong. I mean, mm -hmm. there is, there is an Amazon package out there waiting for me right now. Like yeah. we use it all the time. Um, but I don't go on there to get a brand experience. I don't go on there to, and I know they're working on it because I, I've built that stuff for our, our brand mm -hmm. online, but it's not the same. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I really like, I don't even know if they'll ever be able to get, and I hope they don't because that, that is the Holy grail for a small business is that you can, you can tell your story. You can, you can, you can tell who you are. You can have connections with, you own those people 
um, and their data, which is which is huge, and you can speak to them through your emails, through your uh, through your phone calls, all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. So, I definitely think that you know anybody who's worried about Amazon, you know, just find where you differentiate, and that's where it is is, is being being authentically yourself. Whereas Amazon is really a commodity. And so like people go there to buy stuff that's cheap and in, um, you know, you just need to find something that can't be found on there. can't really be re- replicated on that. I mean, yeah. for us, it's like felt can shoes, like, you know, um, you know, nobody can ever replicate the felt brand because it belongs to us. So, um, you know, anybody buying on there is, is going to be, um, the, one of the talkers talks yesterday was actually the Birkenstock guy and they mm. went through that big thing with, yeah. and he was talking about that a little bit and he was just like, it wasn't where we wanted to take the brand and like, they were not, you know, they weren't listening yeah. to us. And so we pulled. So, um, you know, the, the idea is that like you can create a brand and, and you, you get that a lot more of a personal thing with a yeah. small company. And I think a lot of people are gravitating towards that now. Yeah, I, I see that too. It's at Amazon, exactly what you said. It's, it's great for businesses and it drives a lot of sales. But like you said, they won't be able to replicate the brand, the founder, the presence, the, the rich exactly. history of exactly. a company can only be told through your own website or through your own channels. Yeah. And I think as a founder or, or small business, that just makes you connect more with your, the people that are buying your products versus just, oh, let me make a product and release it out there. It's now... I have a story and I, I need to tell it and everybody's, you have to become your own personal brand for yeah. your business essentially. And, yeah. and because they're going to believe you and, and your story and the company behind it. Cause I mean, that's what you see right now. It's, I mean, a good example is shark tank. Like you're, you're, I, when I look at it, I'm looking at the founders. I'm like, Oh my God, that story is just so cool and amazing. And the product is everything that's around that story. And yeah, that's why I made them. And that's why people fall in love with the products. Yeah. And so and, and it's, it's the whole package too, as well. And I, you know, your, the stories, like the story is so important. It's really mm-hmm. difficult to tell a good story. Um, uh, I got another book that like, if anybody's listening, yeah. should read is um, story brand. Um, just look it up. It's on like, it's, it's, I mean, there's plenty of story like, but you know, like you know brand you know basically telling a story through a brand uh books um this one was particularly good for me so um donald uh donald miller i think his name okay. is i i got a lot out of his book um and it, it actually takes you through the steps of actually telling a story as as you would if you were telling a story of a movie hmm. um That's good. so yeah i think i think you know we touched on on that as far as you know amazon can never tell your story no. um not in the way that you can anyway. And so everything that you, that, that the customer touches should just not be the Amazon brown yeah. box. No. Like just plain thing. It, everything should be about your brand. Yeah. And, and the way I think about it too is it sort of made like business owners, you know, I have my own company as well. It has made us better because essentially it means that you need to compete at a different level. And yeah. I think that's why people are scared because that just raised the stakes. And a good example is obviously all those BTC companies, kind of like yourself, where you just have to raise your standards now and become better. And, you know, we saw companies like, I guess, P&G, Procter & Gamble, just releasing the same version of toothpaste 20 times, yeah, calling it something new. And it's like, they're only, they're only winning because they have that shelf space. But there's oh, no, they, yeah, and that they're following, and yeah. and and that's why these guys like Warby Parker and these disruptive brands come in because they see that what these guys are doing. Yep. They 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 see through the facade of just like doing exactly what you just said, bringing out another pair of sunglasses and bringing out or like everybody owns that, and, and yep. they're like, we can do this better. Yep. And it's really, it's difficult. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's very very difficult to execute on it. And it's mm-hmm. difficult to see, but when you do see it and you want to, you want to do it, like you can make a complete difference. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. you really can compete with those bigger guys. And, 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 and you just have to, you don't have to look far to see the guys that, I mean, there are plenty of people beyond that, that have failed doing yeah. that. But 
I mean, if you're yeah. not going to try, you're never going to get anywhere. So Exactly. And I think that just makes it better. I think a good example would be like, you know, people always look up to like, you know, Dollar Shape Club, that founder, yeah. that great video. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. People are like, that was so unique and really was competing against a big giant like Gillette. And no one would ever think a few years ago that could happen. But look, unique story, unique story that Gillette would never make, a unique risk. Uh, that's a risk that Gillette would never make with that story with funny sort of provocative. Yeah. And, and I think that's what, what's required now. Yeah. It's, I mean, he started that whole genre of, of funny videos. Yeah. It's crazy. So. Yeah, yeah. Just one guy. It's, it's, it's sort of where we wrap back to the beginning. It's like reality is designed by somebody around you. He just started yeah. to make that. And now that's our reality. That's yeah. What it, the same, same with Tom's shoes is another one. Yeah. Exactly the same thing, you know, where he decided one for one and now everybody is trying to do this, um, you know, like is, is doing the same version a hundred different times, yep. like different, and, and they're all coming up with their diff, own different spin, which, you know, you can think of it as, as it's copying, which some people blatantly are, yeah. or other people are just inspired by that. You know, it's like being inspired by the color red, you know, like, you know, you yeah. come up with different shades. And, and so that I think is, I think it's awesome. And I, I, honestly, if I was him, I think it's probably, I would be probably the thing I'm most proud about is because you've brought this community awareness to, to social problems, which is like, I mean, far more than, probably yeah. what 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 tom's has created um he's created a whole movement of companies that are making money for good you know and and well we hope anyway I yeah. mean, that, that's what they tell us but yeah. um nonetheless not to be cynical but like i assume that's you know that's what's happening and so that that for me as a legacy i'd be like that's so cool i changed i changed the way people do business that's awesome. yeah and, and yeah exactly like that whole legacy for tom's is like it's exactly what you said before it's probably been worth more than what he's done just because the sheer volume of companies that are exactly. following that model yeah okay. exactly okay perfect steve last question for you uh, great talk so far i love it where can we go to learn more about you know felskoon slide hand boards yourself your story you know where can people go to you know learn more about yourself uh, well, we haven't, um, so, you know, just, um, to give your, your listeners kind of an uh, overview is we, we've started fun brands, which is kind of our umbrella company. And underneath that is, um, anything fun. So, <laughs> so, uh, handboarding, you know, body surfing handboards are, are definitely fun. A felt schoon are like super fun, um, mm -hmm. colorful, um, bright. Our mission for the company is just, uh, to you know, to spread to spread uh, optimism and love and 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 um, and just for people that smile, and um, so yeah, you can find uh, Feltskun at feltskun.com, feltskunshoes.com. Uh, so that's www. Feltskun uh, 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 shoes.com. Sorry. <laughs> So it's kind of a mouthful, but it, it felt good is actually an Afrikaans yeah. word. Um, my wife is from Rhode Island, so I get her like whenever I want to laugh, I just ask her to say felt good, and yeah. she's like, felt good. <laughs> so anyway, it means field shoe because um, uh, that's where it's come from, and that's the name of them. And then slide handboards, which is S L Y D E. Um, H A N D B O A R D S dot com. So you can. Um, for both of those, you can you can read more about um, myself and Ange on slide, um, and then felt good. And more of that'll will will start to come in, and it's um, yeah, that's where you, that's where you can see it. All right, thank you so much, Dave, for your time. Really appreciate it. I really enjoyed our chat, and uh, thank you so much. No worries, no worries. I had a great time. Thank you. This week's episode of Digital Marketing Fastlane was brought to you by the performance marketing experts at Voy Media. Join us again next time as we'll be bringing you more tips, techniques, and know-how to make your online business the very best that it can be. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, we'd love to hear them on Twitter at Voy Media. Thank you.